Welcome to the show. I'm Antisocial. And this is the Antisocial Network. I want to talk to her, but I, my face is up against the wall. Yeah, I think she wants to talk to me, but I'm antisocial. Yeah. This week, we're talking about Texas's archaic abortion ban and revisiting an old episode, Vasectomies for Kids. Thanks for tuning in! really frustrated about the Texas abortion ban this past week. Not only has Texas outlawed abortions at six weeks when most people don't even know they're pregnant yet, but the state is awarding $10,000 bounties to anyone who turns in someone who has had an abortion or who assists with one. And that's not just medical professionals. You can even snitch on the Uber driver that took them there. Instead of giving new mothers forced to have children $10,000, they're incentivizing civilians to demonize and rat out their friends, family, and neighbors. And where are the consequences for the men who get people pregnant or encourage their partner to terminate a pregnancy? Texas's abortion ban will not stop the number of abortions happening. It will only stop the safe abortion from happening. Access to reproductive health care and family planning is already disproportionately difficult for people of color and trans people. This law will absolutely put those marginalized communities further at risk. For those who don't understand or who need to hear it, men can get pregnant too. Just like women can have a penis and can get someone pregnant. Gendering the language surrounding this abortion ban discounts large populations of people who are adversely affected by it. Trans people already face discrimination trying to access these services, and laws like the Texas abortion ban can be a death sentence for some. Additionally, we need to remember that while these laws were implemented in Texas, our own United States Supreme Court turned the case down, validating and upholding the Texas law. If the highest court in the land will uphold this archaic ass-backwards law in Texas, then we're all in danger. Furthermore, the constant comparison of Handmaid's Tale to what's happening right now is gaslighting a shit ton of people. And I admit, I did it myself by calling this some Gilead-level insanity, when it was pointed out to me by several black creators why this is not okay. As at Rinstar said in a TikTok, the fact that white feminists' first point of comparison for the Texas abortion bill is the handmaid's tale and not the way that the actual American government has treated black and brown women for centuries is very telling. Their only frame of reference for this is the oppression of fictional white women because they don't seem to realize that when white people write dystopian fiction, it's almost always just imagining things that have actually happened to people of color as though they happened to white people. And for a lot of white people, that is their only frame of reference for those things happening. (sighs) It is a crucial point for us to remember, because going forward, white pregnant people in Texas will still have more options available to them than non-whites, even while the ban is in place. It's also important to remember that Texas is not increasing funds to assist new mothers or invest in children's futures by implementing these laws, and there remains zero consequences for people with penises who cause unwanted pregnancies. And that's how we know this is not about family planning, or conservative values, or life beginning at the point of conception, or a heartbeat, or whatever. This is purely about controlling women. The fact that this law goes into effect at six weeks proves how little these lawmakers fucking understand about women's bodies and reproduction. I have a friend who experienced some uterine bleeding in her first six weeks of pregnancy, which is totally normal, and she thought it was a period, so she didn't know she was pregnant until week eight. 
If these asshat lawmakers fucking understood a goddamn thing about periods and pregnancy, they would understand how impossible this ban is. Many clinics will not even perform an abortion until after week six if the embryo isn't the size healthcare professionals have determined is within the window for termination or whatever. So make no mistake, a six-week abortion ban is in effect an outright abortion ban, since such a small percentage of people are even able to detect their pregnancy and get to a clinic before then. And here's the thing for me when it comes to advocacy and activism. I don't believe everyone should have to advocate for every cause all of the time. I get burnt out and I just can't know everything about everything. Plus, it depends who that frustration is aimed at. I saw a black woman post a screenshot of a DM she got on Instagram from a white woman demanding that she post about what was happening in Texas or she would unfollow. Look, ladies, that's not the way to go about this, is for us to start turning on each other. And while anyone can get pregnant or have a penis, I do feel compelled to say that for the number of cis straight men I know who have personally benefited from abortion, I'm pretty goddamn fed up with them being silent on this issue. Now it's one thing to curate your social media and not post about certain things, but it's a different story to feign ignorance entirely. I posted about this, the lack of solidarity and support from cis men, straight and gay, and got one man, a gay man, who lived in Texas, comment that he didn't know what my post was in reference to. What? How? He said he didn't watch TV or follow the news, but neither do I. I caught this news from social media and my feed was flooded with posts about it this past week. Who are you following that you didn't hear about this? He's following 2,942 people. I call bullshit. I had another man, a cishet black man, ask me in earnest how he can start helping add to this conversation because he feels like it's not his place and men speaking on abortion might adversely affect women in their life. Oh my god, y'all, I was stunned. Because people who have abortions face way more stigma and consequences than the people who get us pregnant. And furthermore, my answer was that he can advocate for women in the same way I advocate for people I don't look like all the time. I follow black and brown and native creators. I follow fat and disabled people. I follow trans and non-binary and gay people. I follow neurodivergent people and all sorts of intersections of race and queerness and body positivity. And I listen to what they have to say, and I share their content. These men can talk about abortions without outing their exes for having one. They can speak about how an abortion allowed them to finish school, or avoid 18 years of child support, or, I don't know, allow them to move on and fall in love with the love of their life and start a family with them on down the road. Cis men benefit from abortion. They need to talk about that. I have started on a conscious path of anti-racism work, and men who say they want to dismantle the patriarchy and be allies to women can make a similar commitment in their lives to participate in these conversations. The good thing is I heard the Texas snitch line for the $10,000 bounties was already flooded with fake reports from across the country. Under pressure, their web host GoDaddy decided to drop them. Also, the Supreme Court reconvenes on October 4th, and there is already a nationwide women's march scheduled to happen on October 2nd. Text MARCH, M-A-R-C-H, to 44310 to get updates about upcoming action in your area. I do take issue with it being called a women's march. Again, I think if we call ourselves intersectional feminists, then removing gender from issues surrounding pregnancy and family planning is the direction our movement needs to be headed in. However... I do think a lot of the issues I spoke about in my Vasectomies for Kids episode are relevant this week and need to be heard. That's why the rest of this episode is going to be a replay of episode 8, Vasectomies for Kids. If you've already listened to episode 8, I don't blame you for bowing out now. But if you're a Californian, do not forget to vote no on the recall! And now, on to Vasectomies for Kids! It is seriously so fucking stupid that male birth control is not more advanced by now. There's literally no excuse for it. Well, other than misogyny. The only reason we don't have better options for male birth control by now is misogyny. Full stop. Men have made the argument for as long as family planning has been around that it is somehow easier or more practical for women to regulate pregnancy when the reality is that it is infinitely easier and less invasive to stop the problem at the source with ejaculation. 
For the purpose of this episode surrounding contraception, I am referring to women who have uteruses and people with the ability to be gestational parents, and I'm referring to men who have penises and people who possess the ability to impregnate a womb with semen. I'm clarifying this because I understand that not all women have uteruses and not all men have penises or ejaculate. Taking birth control can be gender-affirming for trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people of all types, and remains relevant and necessary for all sexually active people who run the risk of unwanted pregnancy. That said, going forward, when referring to men and women, I am largely discussing cisgendered people. To my surprise, finding research on this was not as easy as I expected. After all, I remember listening to a colleague do a persuasive speech on male birth control when I was in college back in 2008, and she went into great detail about the science and viability of hormonal birth control for men. And that was 13 years ago! Why wasn't Google populating pages and pages of peer-reviewed articles on this subject? After some scrolling, I was able to find articles published by NPR, the BBC, and CNN, but it was still far too little information. Every other subject I've covered so far has had more accessible data, and this is quite literally an age-old problem. So where's the research? Where are the grants and foundations? How is this not something men are not equally interested in solving? While conducting these searches, I came across a great thread on Twitter. Gabrielle Blair, or at Design Mom, had this to say. I'm a mother of six, a Mormon. I have a good understanding of arguments surrounding abortion, religious and otherwise. I've been listening to men grandstand about women's reproductive rights, and I'm convinced men actually have zero interest in stopping abortion. Here's why. If you want to stop abortion, you need to prevent unwanted pregnancies. And men are 100% responsible for unwanted pregnancies. Perhaps you're thinking, it takes two! And yes, it does take two, for intentional pregnancies. But all unwanted pregnancies are caused by the irresponsible ejaculations of men. Period. Don't believe me? Let me walk you through it. Let's start with this. Women can only get pregnant about two days each month. And that's for a limited number of years. That makes 24 days a year a woman might get pregnant. But men can cause pregnancy 365 days a year. In fact, if you're a man who ejaculates multiple times a day, you could cause multiple pregnancies in just one year. And, though their sperm gets crappier as they age, men can cause unwanted pregnancies from puberty till death. So, just starting with basic biology and the calendar, it's easy to see men are the issue here. Boom! Gabrielle Blair not only lays out the facts about men's role in fertility and conception, she does it while being pro-life and a Mormon to boot. Speaking of birth control methods, let's talk about ovulation. Honestly, I didn't learn about ovulation until I was in my late 20s or 30s, and in my experience, most women don't really learn about ovulation until they're trying to conceive. That's fucking wild to me! I learned about condoms and birth control pills in the fucking fifth grade in sex ed, and no one thought to mention to us ever that conception can be managed by tracking ovulation? Why? I know it's not perfect, but the amount of women I know who have gotten pregnant while on the pill isn't a great argument for the pill, either. You have to be incredibly consistent with the pill, and if you miss your window, it will fail. Not to mention the counter-effects of medications like antibiotics that could interfere with the pill's efficacy. We're also spun a lie that birth control pills are not as effective for heavier women, but new research has shown that's a lie. Point being, we're told about the pill when we're 12, so why not also add the ovulation education? While not 100% effective, no birth control method is, and it's best to have as many tools in our arsenal as possible. Basically, once I learned about ovulation well after I'd been menstruating for over a decade, and I asked just why it is girls are not educated more about ovulation, I was told that it's actually very complicated to track, not a precise science, and definitely not 100% effective. They make it sound like tracking your ovulation is some sort of witchcraft and about as viable as the pullout method. Which is false. If tracking ovulation was ineffective, they wouldn't be teaching so many women in their 30s how to do it in order to increase their ability to get pregnant. Doesn't it follow that we could also be teaching women about ovulation to prevent pregnancy? I'm going to reiterate this because not all women seem to understand it. I know that I didn't. Gabrielle Blair says that on average, women can only get pregnant two days a month. Yep, you heard that right! 
Meanwhile, according to the internet and men's tendency to exaggerate their abilities, supposedly men can ejaculate up to seven times in a session. Whatever a session is. Let's just round it up to a day and say men can come seven times a day. Don't at me about your coming prowess, I don't care. So technically, theoretically, a man can impregnate 2,555 women in one year if he knocks up seven a day. Meanwhile, a woman can only get pregnant once every nine months even if she sleeps with seven partners a day. Growing up, we as women are treated like we can get pregnant if we even breathe in the same room as sperm, which is markedly untrue. Why are we forced into 24-7 hormonal contraception so young when we don't even run the risk of getting pregnant 24-7? Yet boys have the potential to impregnate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Their sperm is viable all day, every day. Heck, we're taught even their pre-cum isn't safe. So why does the burden of contraception and preventing pregnancy fall largely on women? While on the subject of the efficacy of tracking ovulation versus pulling out, according to Planned Parenthood, the pull-out method is 96% effective when done correctly. Pulling out is 78% effective on average, but then again, the pill is only 91% effective on average. Conversely, tracking ovulation alone works only about 75% of the time, so it's actually less effective than pulling out. And if done properly, pulling out is more effective than the pill. So why aren't men pulling out every time they have sex when they don't have the intention of conceiving? I mean, if they care about preventing unwanted pregnancy in the lives of unborn babies, wouldn't they pull out every time? Well, apparently climaxing inside a vagina is a little more enjoyable than pulling out. So can you really blame them? Some of the articles I read claim that many men say they would be interested in taking a male birth control pill if one existed. I call bullshit. That's like saying men would go through all the pain of childbirth if they could. A real convenient piece of lip service for something that's not even possible. For all you men who say they'd like to take the birth control pill if it became available, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and get a vasectomy? What, is that too invasive for you and your widow Puess's pee-pee? Sure, a vasectomy isn't free, but it's not like it's not reversible. Besides, it comes with none of the harmful side effects women face due to the use of hormonal forms of birth control. Women have been dealing with mood swings, weight gain, hair growth, loss of sex drive, prolonged or permanent infertility, and more as a result of hormonal birth control for decades, when castration has existed for much longer. Gabrielle Blair goes on in her Twitter thread to say, Modern birth control is possibly the greatest invention of the last century, and I'm very grateful for it. It's also brutal. The side effects for many women are ridiculously harmful. So ridiculous that when an oral contraception for men was created, it wasn't approved because of side effects. And the list of side effects was about one-third as long as the known side effects for women's oral contraception. Blair cites an NPR article titled, Male Birth Control Study Killed After Men Report Side Effects. In my own research, I learned that in a trial study of male birth control, men, including men taking the placebo, reported that they experienced some difficulty getting it up. That's the fear. They won't be able to get boners. Because face it, ladies, as long as our holes are open and unobscured, they don't care if we're horny, if it hurts, or if we want it. The side effects of birth control on women don't matter as long as it doesn't hinder their ability to get it in. And the second a male birth control comes to trial, they're all screaming about how their boners don't work. It's a fucking ruse and a lie. Just like blue balls. How stupid do they think we are? I was talking to a man this week and mentioned I was writing about male birth control. He said, tell me about this male birth control. I was thinking of getting snipped. And I replied, male birth control doesn't exist. Get the vasectomy. He then went on to hypothesize that perhaps male birth control pills do not exist because there would be some wild adverse side effects. I asked him if he'd done any research regarding it or actually looked into it at all, and he admitted that he hadn't. That was just his initial gut instinct, friends. You know how men like to speak from places of authority without any real credentials? When I pointed out that women face all kinds of side effects from taking birth control and that society largely doesn't care about the suffering of women, and suggested that perhaps male birth control doesn't exist because of misogyny, he told me that society doesn't care about a lot of things and unmatched me on Tinder. I mean, what do I know? I've just been taking birth control on and off for 20 years. I hope he gets that vasectomy. 
When I polled my friends online to see what they knew about ovulation and male birth control, I got a range of differing responses. A woman explained about tracking ovulation. That's called the rhythm method, and I believe Catholics have been told to practice that for years so they don't get pregnant. Well, at least Catholic women have been taught it. All men know is, not tonight, sweetheart, I have a headache. What my friend is referring to with the rhythm method is what I meant when I said people have been practicing family planning for centuries. And her little quip about, not tonight, honey, I have a headache, reminds me of a post I saw circulating recently. Dumbass at Kyle's Bogus Journey had the audacity to write, Female privilege is getting to claim a headache to avoid sex. But remember what my friend said about the rhythm method and claiming a headache to avoid getting pregnant? Women don't always have the luxury of being taken seriously when we express simple disinterest or even try to explain that if we abstain tonight, we won't have to worry about pregnancy. In response to dumbass Kyle's post about women experiencing privilege for declining sex, at OMG Oswin correctly asserts that in actuality, female oppression is having to claim physical illness to avoid sex because men won't take a simple fucking no for an answer. It is important to remember that marital rape was not criminalized nationwide in the United States until 1993. Many men still believe they are entitled to sex from their partner and are resentful towards women who deny them. Women baby-trapping men into commitment is a common trope that men's rights activists like to bring up. But if men baby-trapping women wasn't a thing, Catholic women wouldn't need to lie to their partners about the rhythm method by claiming a headache, right? To think that some men don't push women into motherhood with deliberate unwanted pregnancies and that they haven't been doing that since the beginning of time is naive and just untrue. Plus, men are squeamish and find any discussion of women's anatomy or menstruation unbecoming and consider that lady affairs. Why would they want to hear or learn about ovulation? If experience has taught us anything, it's that it's much safer to just say we have a headache. Additionally, I've heard men say they have a desire to spread their seed and get as many women pregnant as possible. Some men have an innate drive to create as many heirs as they can. Women often get vilified for having children with several men. While not only do men have children with several women all the time, they may even do it without knowing it or having any responsibility or part in the child's life whatsoever. I even found an article by Rolling Stone titled, Why Some Men Are Obsessed With Inseminating As Many Women As Possible, and others with headlines like, Man Plans To Impregnate 2,500 Women, and Sperminator With 99 Kids Shares His Secrets. I find it quite disturbing that the whole women baby-trapping men is a common men's rights trope when it's far easier to find articles on men who have a bizarre obsession with seeding as many women as humanly possible. It becomes much less of a mystery when I can't find reputable articles on male birth control when I can pull up pages on men who seem to have a compulsive desire to repopulate the planet with their sperm alone. It would seem that the more research I do, the more Gabrielle Blair was right. Men have zero interest in stopping unwanted pregnancies. While we're here, Blair elaborates, let's talk a bit more about pleasure and biology. Did you know that a man can't get a woman pregnant without having an orgasm? Which means that we can conclude getting a woman pregnant is a pleasurable act for men. But did you further know that men can get a woman pregnant without her feeling any pleasure at all? In fact, it's totally possible for a man to impregnate a woman even while causing her excruciating pain, trauma, or horror. In contrast, a woman can have non-stop orgasms and never once get herself pregnant. A woman's orgasm has literally nothing to do with pregnancy or fertility. Her clitoris exists not for creating new babies, but simply for pleasure. No matter how many orgasms she has, they won't make her pregnant. Pregnancies can only happen when men have an orgasm. Unwanted pregnancies can only happen when men orgasm irresponsibly. What this means is a woman can be the sluttiest slut in the entire world who loves having orgasms all day long and all night long and she will never find herself with an unwanted pregnancy unless a man shows up and ejaculates irresponsibly. Men enjoying sex and having irresponsible ejaculations is what causes unwanted pregnancies and abortion. Whew! Oh, it's time to take my pill. Let's go to break.
If you love bunt cakes and true crime, you're going to want to stay tuned. If you find yourself staying awake late into the evening watching murder shows while baking, you need this subscription box, the bunt a killer subscription box. We do hot takes on killer cakes. Every month you will receive a DVD outlining the gory details of one of the world's most notorious serial killers and a new Bundt Cake recipe themed to that month's murder. Past popular cakes include BTK Bacon Maple, Raspberry Ramirez, Double Chocolate Charles Manson, and a holiday favorite, our Jean Bonnet Pineapple Pastry Cake. Combine two of your favorite pastimes today and Bundt a Killer! Helisesh is the early 2000s-themed marijuana subscription box of your dreams. Is pot legal in your state, but you miss the days when it wasn't? Helisesh brings the nostalgia and thrill of buying illegal pot to your door, delivered safely in a sealed, overly taxed, and totally legal way. But you don't have to know that. Your delivery man shows up in his 1989 Camry with at least one headlight or taillight out, guaranteed. Your weed will always come in something new and exciting, from a Ziploc bag to a used Chips Ahoy package. And sometimes it's just seeds and stems. Your driver then stays a while as you smoke him out with some of the weed he just sold you because he doesn't want to raise suspicion by leaving too soon. So you watch old skateboard videos and jackass. Upgrade to our premium box for the authentic experience, complete with court dates and heavy fines. Hellasesh. Hello, comrades! If you often get accused of hostile, militant behavior when you're just trying to get to work, we may have the answer for you. Soup for your family is the perfect solution to ward off fascists, bootlickers, and their sympathizers. If you are constantly harassed and bullied by the state while merely trying to fight for the rights of the proletariat, we see you. Soup for your family is a great way to not only feed your family, but it serves as a silent signal to like-minded comrades that you stand with them in the fight against fascism. Whether you're eating it or throwing it in an act of solidarity, soup for your family will never let you down. Welcome back. And just kidding, folks. I don't take the pill. This JJ is dry and full of cobwebs. When I have asked men about their motivations for wanting to use birth control, often they cite reasons that still place blame on women. I rarely hear men cite wanting to protect their partner as a reason. Another friend who commented on my poll about ovulation and male birth control had this to say. Male birth control would be awesome. I went through having and subsequently losing a child with a woman who had lied to me about getting birth control shots. Would love the option to take control of that. It just sucks that the way he framed it was that he sees male birth control as a necessity because essentially, sometimes you can't trust these bitches and hoes. I mean, that's the vibe I got anyway. Although, I guess if it's an argument that works to get men interested in taking control of their fertility, I don't hate it. I'm in favor of whatever is going to motivate men to be interested in taking a birth control pill. After all, no one should be forced into an unwanted pregnancy, including men. That doesn't mean men should be able to regulate or force abortions on women once they've gotten pregnant. It means they need to be more responsible with their ejaculations in the first place. Gabrielle Blair said in her post, When the topic of abortion comes up, men might think, Abortion is horrible. Women should not have abortions. And never once consider the man who caused the unwanted pregnancy. If you're not holding men responsible for unwanted pregnancies, then you're wasting your time. When I googled, why doesn't male birth control exist, the first response I got read, Part of the challenge comes down to simple biology. To interrupt fertility in a female body, a contraceptive needs to prevent a single egg from being fertilized, which can only occur in a limited time window. Males, on the other hand, create 1,500 sperm a second and are fertile at all times. <laughs> that is such a false argument, it's laughable. And men say women can't reason. Ha! By this same logic, doesn't it make infinitely more sense to sterilize men at the source? If you knock over a jug of water on the counter and it begins spilling all over the floor, it would be pretty stupid to start by cleaning up the floor while liquid is still pouring all over the counter, continuously hitting the ground. It makes way more sense to start cleaning at the counter and stop the jug from pouring everywhere. 
Men will scoff and react like it's insane to think we should regulate male ejaculation to prevent unwanted pregnancies. But women's bodies and behaviors are regulated all the time. What about school dress codes that indiscriminately oppress girls and femmes? What about victim blaming in the what was she wearing crowd? What about curfews put in place to protect women from being assaulted that punish women instead of keeping men home, the ones perpetrating violence in the first place? What about women who are labeled old maids and deficient for choosing not to have children, or who can't have children? And the women who are vilified and demonized for having children with more than one man, or for having, quote, too many children? What about the backlog of unchecked rape kits in America, or the fear of not being believed if one reports an assault? What about abortion laws, lack of access to contraceptives and family planning facilities, and a justice system that often hides and protects perpetrators? Women live in a society where we are constantly blamed for everything that happens to us while simultaneously being treated like precious objects that can't reason well and don't know what's best for ourselves. Birth control can cause all sorts of harmful effects, wreaking havoc on our bodies. But fortunately for men, we're still willing to take it. It's not outrageous to consider ways to regulate men's fertility that would result in fewer unwanted pregnancies. What would that look like, you ask? Thanks to Gabrielle Blair's detailed and thorough post, she gives us some possible solutions. First, she suggests that there be a consequence for men who irresponsibly ejaculate and cause an unwanted pregnancy, like castration. She posits that if a castration law was on the books, we could effectively eliminate abortion in less than three months without ever having to outlaw them. Considering that there might be some pushback to such legislation, Blair suggests this prevention method instead. At the onset of puberty, all males in the United States could be required by law to get a vasectomy. Vasectomies are very safe, totally reversible, and about as invasive as a doctor's exam for a woman getting a birth control prescription. There is some soreness afterwards for about 24 hours, but that's pretty much it for side effects. So much better than the pill, which is taken by millions of women in our country, the side effects of which are well known and can be brutal. If, when, the male becomes a responsible adult, and perhaps finds a mate, if they want to have a baby, the vasectomy can be reversed, and then redone once the childbearing stage is over. And each male can bank their sperm before the vasectomy, just in case. Blair goes on to remind us, it's not that wild of an idea. 80% of males in the U.S. are circumcised, most as babies, and that's not reversible. I didn't cover the science of it much, but the research and technology exists to create a hormonal birth control for men today. From a pill, to a shot, to a hormonal gel that is rubbed into the skin, there are several possibilities that have already proven successful in trial. Additionally, there's an injection method of preventing semen from leaving the penis, a sort of non-surgical vasectomy that is also reversible and has been tested and worked in animals, so far. In all of these initial trials, it seems that while there have been reports of some diminished sex drive in men, side effects were not bad enough for trial users to stop taking birth control during the study period. Given the mild to severe side effects women already experience due to hormonal birth control, there is no reason why these options shouldn't be available to men who can then decide themselves whether the risk is worth the benefit of regulating their fertility. I think it can also be argued that diminishing men's sex drive isn't the worst thing in the world. The birth control pill for women was invented in the 1950s, but not readily available until the 60s. Meanwhile, it's been 60 years since then, and we still don't have an option for men on the market. If men could get pregnant, the male pill would have been invented 160 years ago. Then there's the argument that we couldn't even trust men to take it. And before you get defensive and enraged, this isn't an unrealistic concern. When I asked my friends online what they thought about it, one of my male friends remarked, Men would totally lie about male birth control. Some men actually brag about removing condoms stealth and coming inside during sex. There was a whole bragging subreddit about it. This sort of confession is enough to terrify any sexually active woman. While maybe it's not all men, it's enough men for all women to worry about these types of deceptions. Which, by the way, is assault. Just like a woman might feign a headache to avoid retaliation or abuse from a partner, she also might need to take birth control in secret to protect herself. Some men might get irate at the suggestion that they couldn't be trusted with the responsibility of something like managing fertility or remembering to take a birth control pill. But again, women are constantly treated like children by society. According to the doctrine of toxic masculinity, women are emotional, irrational, and weak. I frequently have men condescend to me in a manner that lets me know they think I'm too stupid to understand them. 
I've frequently had men laugh at me and say it's cute when I try to show my physical strength. It's demeaning and patronizing. And it's not unusual. Women are treated like we're incapable of managing anything other than a household, while men's rights activists spread bullshit false propaganda about a predatory child support system and women as gold diggers with agendas, while perpetuating pickup artist culture or bragging on Reddit about removing condoms without consent. Being worried men won't actually take it sounds like the only valid criticism of male birth control I've heard yet. Regardless, I still believe the only reason male birth control doesn't exist is due to misogyny and a lot of men's unfounded opposition to it based in nothing. In a BBC article titled, Male Pill, Why Are We Waiting? I read that, for whatever reason, pharmaceutical companies and corporations aren't interested in funding a male birth control pill. The technology and science exists, but big business just doesn't see it as financially viable. Hmm, I wonder why. We've established that men don't care about preventing unwanted pregnancies because they refuse to regulate their own irresponsible ejaculations. And I think it's also pretty clear that men don't care about a male birth control pill like they say they do, based on the small percentage of men who actually get vasectomies. Despite being way less expensive, way less invasive, and reversible, only about 9% of American men get vasectomies, while 27% of women end up getting their tubes tied. I could argue all day about the reasons why men should be invested in taking control of their own fertility and should want to take birth control, but at the end of the day, I'd still be left with the same conclusion. That unless there's consequences for causing unwanted pregnancies, developing a male birth control pill will simply not be a priority for most men. I actually like Gabriel Blair's suggestion of mass vasectomies on young boys, but surely a lot of people will not be in favor of this solution. I just know that if we're not going to develop a male birth control pill, and if men are not going to get vasectomies in mass, that what does need to happen is we need to stop blaming women for unwanted pregnancies and do better to provide access to contraceptives in the first place. And until we eliminate the problem of unwanted pregnancies entirely, we need to decriminalize abortion by making it readily accessible and free in every state. That's my show for this week. I'm Antisocial, and this has been the Antisocial Network. If you want even more access to me, Antisocial, follow me on Instagram at the Antisocial Network. To support my content creation dreams and to receive two bonus episodes a month, subscribe to my Patreon for only five bucks at patreon.com slash the Antisocial Network. And for a limited time, new patrons will receive Antisocial Network stickers and a top secret handmade zine made by me, Antisocial. To send me voice memos or to submit your own funny fake ad that I might use in my podcast, download the Anchor app and find my show there. As always, new episodes are available in the free feed every week. See you next Wednesday. Later. Yeah.